The treatment varies. And first and foremost, it's not a cookbook. And the treatment has to be tailored to the individual and the nuances of their illness. And we take into account what is the presentation, what muscle groups are involved. And we might treat someone who has difficulty speaking, swallowing, breathing much differently than someone who has weakness in their arm or their leg. We also have to take into account the comorbidities the individual has in certain drugs I would not use if they had terrible diabetes or were morbidly obese or had severe bone health issues. Other drugs, if they had renal disease, we would not use. So that has to be factored. And then unfortunately in the US, we have to worry about the payer. And so the financial resources of the individual come into play to some extent uh, into how we choose. But we put all of this into our mental formula and come up with what is the safest, rapid, most rapid way to improve strength back to normal. And our goal is normality for the individual. We often start with a class of drugs called cholinesterase inhibitors, the most common of which is mestinon, which only treats symptoms, improves strength for some muscles, not others, for a period of time, and then has to be dosed again. And we use this to sort of stabilize, tweak the system as we go through our diagnostic evaluation and make decisions on therapy. Because it's an immunological disorder, my belief it needs to be treated as such. And so we'll use drugs to suppress the immune system. In my younger patients, I like corticosteroids. They work rapidly and I can use them, get them under good control and then start to bring the dose down. Um, in older patients or those who have contraindications, relative contraindications to steroids, I'll tend to use steroid sparing agents. Mycophenolate, mofetil is now more commonly used in the US. It used to be azathioprine. But azathioprine takes almost a year to start working, way too long to sit and wait. And so mycophenolate has a much faster onset. In some individuals, they'll use the cyclophilin class, tacrolimus cyclosporin emulsion. We can supplement these therapies because there is this long delay uh, to treatment onset effect with things like intravenous immunoglobulin, plasma exchange, which is done intermittently is what we call a bridge therapy while we wait the individual to improve and then uh, reduce those two therapies, either or those therapies and go on with our other drug therapy. And then individuals who have generalized disease will often take out their thymus gland. And there's recent data to suggest that under the age of 60, those who have antibodies are the best candidates. In the past, we took those individuals who did not have antibody or, or antibody and removed their thymus gland, believing that that's where the source of all of this, what we call lack of tolerance uh, begins. And removing that stimulus down the road, we have the best chance to getting them under control. Our treatment strategy is changing and changing very radically and will continue to change in the next few years. We have two new classes of drugs. One are complement inhibitors, which were approved in the US in 2017, and now FCRN inhibitors, uh, which were just approved in December 2021. The complement inhibitor uh, that's approved to date is restricted in its use to those who are deemed failing to have responded to other forms, multiple other forms of therapy. And so its use while gaining a foothold is still limited by our payers uh, to be used. The most recent drug, uh, FCRN inhibitors, uh, it does not have such restriction. And I think we'll see its use start to increase uh, substantially. But why these two drugs? And we have to go back to the mechanism of action. And so we said this was an autoimmune disorder. The antibody attacks the neuromuscular junction, the acetylcholine receptor complex, or a similar protein there in that region. And that antibody then blocks the ability of transmitter to interact with the receptor. It also initiates a turnover process. Receptors have a cycle, and this accelerates this cycle such that 
with either of those two mechanisms, there's a net loss of the number of receptors on the surface of muscle. And if there's too much of a loss, we can't activate that muscle fiber to contract, hence weakness. At the same time, these antibodies activate our complement system, which ultimately leads to the formation of what's been called the membrane attack complex that architecturally destroys the neuromuscular junction, literally physically destroys it by drilling holes, leaking its contents, and then disrupting the membrane. And so these two latest therapies target these two mechanisms. Eculizumab, the first, targeting the complement system, and now Efgartigamod, targeting the antibody. And both have been proven to be quite effective. Um, the bar has been reset. When we talk about our management strategy, there was an interesting editorial in the October issue of Neurology and said, while well, patients with myasthenia gravis are better, are we really helping them? I'm paraphrasing the title. And yes, we physically have made them better, but the adverse event profiles of our current therapy, therapy and toolbox is such that we're not helping them. We're giving them associated diseases, adverse event profiles that are costly, uh, et cetera. So we've not done a good job. And when we look at cross-sectional data from registries, uh, satisfaction surveys, if you will, um, nearly 40% don't like the adverse event profiles. And if you're on a steroid, that number jumps to 80%, horrific. 42% uh, don't like the time from onset of treatment to when they start to get better. And that's lost time in their life that they can't work, they can't play, et cetera. And when we look at work productivity surveys uh, from various countries, and the data is the worst from the US because we can't really get at it, but in Thailand, 58% lose their job if they have MG. In Japan, more than a third lose their job or are reassigned to a job with lesser pay and lesser hours. In Australia, it's something like 40 some odd percent that have reductions in work productivity. This is a huge societal impact um, that we've not been able to address with the best of our old toolbox. The new strategies, I think, are gonna revolutionize that. Their adverse event profiles are very narrow, fairly benign. Uh, and very tolerable. Both classes of drugs work very rapidly. Uh, the FCRN, the Fgartigamod, within one dose, we're seeing patients improve within two weeks, substantial improvement. And it works by clearing the circulating antibody from the circulation uh, by trapping it into the cell and destroying it. The FCRN class um, is, uh, it was originally identified, FCRN, back in the 50s um, by Professor Bramble, as he identified the mechanism by which mom conveys immunity to the fetus in the last two, three months of life. Um, because infants are not born with their own immune system. They've not been exposed. So it's transferred by passing immunoglobulin across the placenta through this FCRN mechanism. And then in the 90s, Sally Ward uh, at Texas A&M identified that FCRN is actually ubiquitous and it's a salvage pathway for immunoglobulin and it actually recirculates the IgG molecule into the cell and by blocking its destruction, takes it back out into the circulation. So IgG has half-lives that are three, four times our other immunoglobulin classes, I, M, A, uh, et cetera. And so it's a very efficient mechanism. And by blocking it, we can shunt these pathogenic antibodies into a lysosome where they're destroyed. Now, effectively, we can clear some 60% of the circulating IgG. So there's still some around, um, and therefore it needs to be redosed, if you will, to maintain effect. But the interesting aspect of the most recent phase three trial, which was published last July in Lancet Neurology, is that no two patients are the same. When we looked at the durability of response, more than half had treatment effects that went in excess of, of uh, 
uh, two months. Third, when in excess of three months. Some, yes, four to six weeks, but the majority had long lasting effects that were much better uh, than our current therapies with say plasma exchange or IVIG. And some of these patients went a full six months and never needed retreatment, suggesting that we don't need to put somebody on a treatment and then give it to them every single day, day in and day out, that we can treat when the patient needs it. That's not gonna to apply to everybody, but for a large number of patients who want independence, this becomes a very important aspect. And so I see this gaining a fairly substantial foothold in the ability to meet the needs of the individual, produce significant efficacy, and oh, the efficacy was substantial um, for a prolonged period of time. Um, not all drugs are usable in all patients, and so one has to pick and choose carefully. Um, but one can see drugs like FCRN becoming primary therapy for individuals um, because of the fact that it is efficacious, because of the fact that its side effect profile is much better than much of what we use. And we have to convince the payer that um, by reducing the overall treatment burden, as well as improving the disease burden, the cost effectiveness of these drugs uh, is well worth it. Um, there are other individuals who have uh, situations in which complement inhibitors will be a primary indication. And we don't have enough data as to who fits best where yet. Uh, that's going to come. Uh, we need real world data and evidence. Clearly cost is an issue. Uh, the current complement inhibitor uh, is very pricey and um, and, and that has to be taken into account, although it clearly has radicalized uh, or revolutionized our patients. You know, that phase three trial were in those patients who failed everything. And yet 60% at the end of the blinded phase of the study were better. And then when they were followed for another 150, 200 weeks, the overwhelming majority improved, suggesting that those who had failed all therapies to date had the potential to get better, uh, which was a revolutionary um, uh, eye-awakening uh, observation. We've always believed that once you destroy the neuromuscular junction, it's gone, it can't recover. And that may not be true. It may be that with aggressive therapy and targeting this architectural destruction, we can recover viable tissue and afford these patients who have failed everything um, and give them a new lease on life. So I see roles for both. 